Hello, my name is uh, Gülsüm Küçüksever. It's the Southwest Initiative uh, for the study of Middle East conflicts. Uh, welcome to the last edition of Sismic Presents, uh, our weekly discussion program with the specialists on the most current issues of the Middle East conflict. Uh, today we are hosting Mr. Kerim Balcı. Uh, he is a Turkish writer, journalist and academician. He is currently the editor-in-chief of Turkish Review, a bi-monthly journal published by Zaman Media Group of Turkey. Balcı is a frequent columnist in today's Zaman and Zaman Dailies, both the, both the largest circulating newspapers in their boulevard, and he corresponds to several local and international TV channels on issues related to the Middle East. Kerim Balcı studied physics and political science and international relations at the Bosphorus University in Turkey. He has an MA from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the city where he served as the representative of Zaman Turkish Daily for eight years. He is currently a PhD candidate at the Dur Durham University in the UK on linguistic philosophy. Apart from his professional job as a journalist, Balcı works with interfaith dialogue groups in Europe to promote multiculturalism. He served as the president of the London-based Dialogue Society for two and a half years before his current assignment in Istanbul. He has edited a book named Whose War in Turkish, dealing with the Iraqi war, and he also published an album called Adam in Jerusalem in Photographs, published in Turkish, English, and Arabic. He published several articles in academic and popular books and encyclopedias, mainly about the Middle East, Turkish politics, U.S. policy in the Middle East, and interfaith dialogue. Welcome, Mr. Balcı. It's very nice to have you in Tucson. Thank you. This was lengthy. Uh, so uh, my first question is, in one of your recent articles, you talk about Turkey as part of change in the Arab world and argue that the changes that happened in the last five years in Turkey accelerated the other Arab mobilization. So what has changed in Turkey in the last 10 years? Can you sum up for those who don't follow Turkish politics very closely? First of all, I am not trying to say Turkey is also a part or as a mobilizer in the changes in the Arab world. I'm saying that Turkey is a part also of the changes that are taking place in the Arab world. In fact, I do look at uh, what is called Arab Spring in the uh, general uh, media as a universal phenomenon. And Turkey was a part of this also. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had to look at the beginning of what started in uh, Tunis, actually we have to go back one more year and look at uh, Kyrgyzstan, where a po similar popular revolt changed uh, the dictator uh, in that country. Uh, we can look at Turkey uh, in a similar uh, prism and we will see in Turkey that there is uh, an ongoing revolution in Turkey. Uh, if, if you wish, you, call, you can call it a silent revolution or nonviolent revolution, but certainly a revolution of people's understanding of their position vis-a-vis -vis the state. Mm -hmm. The definition of citizenship in Turkey was never clear. The citizen never realized that he is the sovereign of the country during the Republican era. In the last uh, five to ten years, uh, largely thanks to the European Union membership process and the reforms made uh, therein, uh, we saw the Turkish people realize their power and in fact claim uh, sovereignty back from the uh, deep state organs, from the constitution, as it was written by a, a junta government, from the military, uh, from the elites, and so on. So uh, I may say in that sense, if, if this is a universal phenomenon, mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street had already appeared in Turkey, but in a much uh, dispersed and nonviolent uh, sense. Mm -hmm. In the last 10 years, uh, Turkish people became in the center of uh, politics in Turkey. Uh, previously, Turkish politics was basically an elitist politics run mainly by ultra-laicist uh, or ultra-secularist, I would rather call them fundamentalist secularists, mm -hmm. uh, a small elitist group uh, of uh, early urbanization of uh, Turkish Republic. Uh, the uh, traditionalists, uh, religious uh, uh, large population, the rural areas were all expelled from power centers. Uh, 
looking from the general understanding of core and periphery, uh, Turkey had a sim small but strong core uh, based in Istanbul and in An Ankara, and uh, the rest, the periphery, was never taken in. Mm -hmm. In the last five years, that core, that, that core is in fact being populated more and more uh, by uh, the periphery. Uh, in fact, uh, we are looking forward to a change in the Constitution, and if the Constitution is also rewritten, uh, I may say the periphery will become the new core uh, of Turkey. In fact, we won't have any more the periphery. We will have just the core, the, the public all, of, all over Turkey, all segments of the population will hopefully become the new uh, owners of sovereignty in Turkey. This is in fact what uh, the youngsters uh, between 25 and 35 years old in Tunis, in Libya, in uh, Egypt, Yemen or Syria are trying to do. They are trying to reclaim the power from their former dictators. We never had a, a real dictators in Turkey, but we had dictatorship. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we never had the kind of uh, unbalance in, separa in distribution of wealth uh, in Turkey as we had it in uh, Egypt, but certainly there was a 5% happy uh, segment of the population which hold 50% of the uh, income of the uh, general nation. So this, uh, uh, this is also changing. We are seeing newcomers to the economic scene, newcomers to the intellectual discussions, newcomers to the media uh, who are basically from the former peripheries of the country. So I may say in short, Turkey had, have had managed to change itself without violence, without killing anybody, uh, without you know passing through a revolutionary era, but making its own revolution. Yeah. While you mentioned the periphery and core, so you are saying that the periphery is coming to the core now. So we are having a you know different time in Turkey. So how do you see that? Because some people say uh, the constitution, the change of the constitution is only is going to actually work only for this certain people, this certain, certain group of people referring to the maybe periphery. And uh, while you are you know, uh, mentioning that, you can also keep this the other question in mind, which is some people call this moment as neo-Ottomanism. So what do you think of that? First of all, uh, the uh, rhetoric, the discourse about uh, Turkey's politics was always kept within the hands and mouths of the uh, small elite that I mentioned uh, mm -hmm. uh, earlier. So m whenever the Westerners uh, appeal to those old uh, elite, they hear these kinds of stories because that elite is in fact losing their uh, privileges. Mm -hmm. They are not happy with the changes. I assume Hosni Mubarak is not happy with what happened to him uh, and certainly uh, Muammar Gaddafi is not happy. Uh, but. Um, there was an injustice in of, uh, of distribution of power in Turkey, and in order to, do to undo the injustice, you have to do justice. And justice says uh, the more you are in uh, numbers, the more you have to have say in uh, governance. Yeah. And the, pr the, the periphery was in fact 90% of the society. Yeah. Uh, only a 10% uh, small uh, happy elite used to rule over the country with their own will uh, and their own will usually didn't overlap with the general will of the society. Now they are not happy because they are losing their privileges. But they are not losing their uh, rights. They are not losing their uh, you know, privileges as citizens. They are losing their unjustly won privileges. Uh, now uh, I'm looking at uh, somebody like me, who used to be a part of the uh, periphery, mm -hmm. who was not given uh, any uh, appeal to the general world media, uh, I'm, I'm able to speak to the world media now. And of course, uh, this discourse will uh, by time change. One of the particular uh, claims this uh, old elite uses in order to uh, defame, I would say, the uh, newcomers into the politics uh, that uh, the newcomers uh, mainly uh, personified in the name of uh, Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan are in fact looking for uh, a neo-Ottoman era. 
I am a newcomer also, and I always say uh, neo-Ottomanism is first of all a, a, an oxymoron because there cannot be any uh, neo-Ottomanism if there was no Ottomanism. There was no Ottomanism in the Turkish history. Ottomans didn't have an ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, so there cannot be anything neo of that didn't exist. Uh, on the other hand, I see neo-Ottomanism if it uh, is a kind of uh, revival of the Ottoman zone of influence within the uh, territories that the Ottomans occupied once upon a time, I see this as a treason to the power, to the potential of uh, the Turkish people. Now we are uh, speaking in Arizona. Uh, the Ottomans had never reached here. We do have a small community here that can do things, that can actually lead discussions about the Middle East. Uh, and I am here as the new core. Uh, this, this is not neo-Ottomanism. If, if we have to say something uh, about it, this is more than that. Uh, the Turkish people uh, do have ambitions for their future, and this is, uh, this is legitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, the next question is, you talked about the revolution in Turkey without any killings. Uh, it is a silent revolution. But to, how do you analyze the Kurdish issue in Turkey? Because we are, you know, Turkey is actually uh, losing, you know, its people um, by dealing with the PKK organization. So where does the problem lie, and how successful the new Turkey is in dealing with the Kurds and also with PK PKK? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think first of all we had to make a separation between the Kurdish issue and the PKK mm -hmm. issue. Kurdish issue is. Uh, uh, problem that was created by the former elite, the uh, fundamentalist secularists that governed uh, the Turkish Republic for 85 years. The mm -hmm. uh, problem was basically a lack of democracy problem. Mm -hmm. The problem was a discrimination problem that was done by the hands of the Turkish military, Turkish government. Uh, the Kurds were not given their most basic human rights, like speaking in their own tongues like education in their own tongues, like being pushed to the edges of the society, being uh, second-class citizens in uh, all over Turkey, uh, being forced to forceful migration. Uh, and uh, their parts of so the uh, uh, Turkish geography being uh, you know, backward economically and so on. This was all done uh, uh, intentionally by the government, by the former fundamentalist secularists. So in that sense, I use the term fundamentalist secularists, but they had other problems. Their, their problem was not only f being fundamentalists by means of their secularism, they were also ultranationalists. Mm -hmm. They were against any kind of non-Turkish, let me say, appearance in the politics. Kurds used to be a part of that uh, elitist group, but only after they were converted into Turkishness. Uh, one uh, famous Turkish politician, Kurdish politician, said in the past, uh, in the era of the fundamentalist secularists, that you can be anything uh, in Turkey as a Kurd, but you cannot be a Kurd. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have had uh, Kurdish speakers of the parliament, but they were not really Kurdish. They were not outspoken Kurdish. So the, the issue, Kurdish issue is was basically a democratization issue, and once again, to some extent, thanks to the European Union reforms to some extent thanks to the willingness of the uh, Turkish population. When I say Turkish, this includes Kurds uh, and uh, other non-Turkish minorities also. The willingness of that population to share uh, the sovereignty of the nation with all the parts of that nation, with every citizen of that nation, uh, the, this pro part of the problem is being solved. Uh, in fact, within the last five years, as I mentioned, the, with the, throughout the silent revolution, there were revolutionary changes uh, by means of the Kurdish issue. Uh, five years ago, Kurdish language uh, was uh, banned, outlawed uh, in public space. You couldn't speak it in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had Kurdish politicians who were jailed uh, because they spoke uh, Kurdish during their rallies. Today, uh, the state runs... Uh, Kurdish broadcasting TV channel. There are several uh, privately owned uh, Turkey, Kurdish TV channels. One, in fact, is being run by uh, a, a famous uh, religious uh, movement called Gulen Movement here in the United States. 
So we see that civil society, in fact, also endorsed uh, the values of the Kurdish people. Uh, the s private schools are opened in uh, southeastern Anatolia. Kurdish people started to make well in business and so on. In that sense, there has been a revolution, a silent revolution once again running within the Kurdish realm. Uh, so I, I am quite optimistic by means of the Kurdish issue. But when we jump to the PKK problem, PKK is a terrorist organization that is being fed by, uh, by the former problems of, of the Kurds in Turkey, largely, but by also foreign powers, uh, including Iran, Syria, uh, and probably some European sympathetic powers uh, to the cause of PKK. This is a separatist organization. It is looking for at least uh, carving an, uh, an autonomous zone within the Turkish uh, soil. This is not fighting only with Turkey. This is fighting with the Kurdish uh, regional government in uh, uh, northern Iraq. This, is f this was fighting with Syria to some extent, with Iran to some extent. But uh, recently they have uh, stopped their fight in Iran and Syria, and they have, uh, they have been dealing with uh, the Turkish government. They are not happy with the revolutionary changes in, uh, on the Kurdish issue because they were nurtured on those discriminations made against their people. Once the democratization standards rose, uh, they have lost their reason, that, their reason of existence, and they're not happy with this. They're not happy with the prospective rewriting of the Constitution because they know then they will lose any kind of legitimacy of existence. So they are increasing their attacks in Turkish uh, cities most of the time, it is not only the Turkish soldiers killed. Most of the t Kurdish, Turkish soldiers are even uh, t Kurdish people in that land, uh, and Kurdish civilians are being killed also. Most recently, they attacked um, a, a bus in which there was only uh, high school uh, students, lady students, and they killed four uh, girls. Uh, this cannot be understood explained with any kind of democratic uh, right-seeking. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, uh, this is a separate uh, problem. This has to be solved once again, continuance in democratization reforms by means of the Kurdish issue. But on the other hand, there is a military side in this also. And no country in the world will keep silent on face of killing of uh, its own citizens. Certainly Turkey will. Uh, take the revenge uh, of killing of its soldiers, its citizens, be them Turks or Kurds. So how do you see the, uh, the recent bombing attack in Iraqi Kurdistan? Actually, maybe we can actually talk about uh, Turkey sending troops to uh, Iraq. How do you see that? Well, uh, the PKK is, um, is stationed, let me say, in uh, a mountainous area called Kandil Mountains in northern Iraq. This is a kind of safe haven uh, for the PKK uh, militants. Uh, and uh, it is not only Turkey that is not happy with their existence there. It is also the uh, regional Kurdish government that is run by uh, Masoud Barzani. Uh, they are not happy with their, their existence there also. Uh, in fact, the most recent uh, gesture done by Masoud Barzani during the uh, recent earthquake in the city of Van, where actually most people were Kurdish people then, there, uh, Masoud Barzani sent one, billion, one million dollars uh, of aid uh, to uh, the Turkish citizens. This gesture shows that the Iraqi Kurds themselves are at the side of Turkey within this fight. And uh, Turkey's uh, interlocutor in this, uh, you know, operations uh, uh, is also the regional government. We are cooperating with the regional government. They are letting the Turkish soldiers in. They are giving some uh, headquarters to the Turkish army so, so that the, the Turkish army will keep a control on the Kandil Mountains. Mm -hmm. They themselves do not have the military logistics to fight with uh, the PKK militants. And of course, we do understand that as Kurds themselves, they will discredit themselves if they were involved in fighting with the PKK uh, militants. So they want Turkey to do this. Mm -hmm. So all the bombings, you know, jet bombings and ground troop operations into 
uh, northern Iraq is in fact made by the permit approval and in fact cooperation mm -hmm. of uh, the regional Kurdish government, central Baghdad, the federal government, and the United States of America, because the United States of America is in fact the occupying uh, force in the region, and without asking the Americans, it would be a kind of uh, intervention into the power, of, power zone of the United States of America. Americans are cooperating with Turkey uh, up until the very end. Turkey has been using information taken from satellites of the United States of America in uh, you know, uh, keeping trail of uh, terrorists in the region. So in that sense, I may say uh, the operations of Turkey are being universally acclaimed and approved.